guys, I hope you're well and welcome to part two of my fibroid story. If you haven't watched part one, please go and watch it and just get up to speed with what was going on and what is still going on in my life. I will say from the outset of this particular video that it's going to get very detailed, it's going to be a bit disgusting. So if you're not into this kind of thing, please click out if you don't like talking about graphic things. Again, this may not be suitable for you. For those of you who are interested, please stick around. So my admission time to the hospital was around seven o'clock in the morning. I got to the hospital, checked in, the staff came to see me, they were fantastic, honestly, they were so lovely, they were telling me not to worry. And then my surgeon came in to see me. So something that they are, and they have to be, something that they're very particular about, something that they have to do for legal reasons and all the rest of it, is to double check that you consent to the surgery that you're having because when you go for your consultation, so the one where he said to me there's at least six fibroids there, he tells you about the risks involved. So the risks involved, the major risks involved, one of which was that your open myomectomy could turn into a hysterectomy, which for any woman, just the thought of that, my goodness. I remember when he said that, I was like, Lord Jesus, please no. And that was something that on my wait to the surgery was on my mind constantly. The amount of times I prayed, please don't convert this surgery to, to a hysterectomy should something be wrong. Um, and one of the reasons is they find something, God forbid, cancerous, right? The other risk factor is that you lose too much blood and you have to have a blood transfusion. That is something else. So those are the two major risks. Of course, there are other minor ones, but they want you to consent to the fact that you understand the risks. Risks can happen in life, but you ultimately consent to have, having this operation. So consented to that. One thing I said to him, and I kept saying to him, please look after me, please look after me. Like I said before, I. I've not gone in for major surgeries first time, you know, thank God, touch wood. So it terrifies you, especially during these times where you cannot take a loved one into the hospital, you are essentially doing it alone. There isn't that kind of like final goodbye and God bless and all the rest of it. You are just going down that corridor by yourself. So he came to see me, we did all of that, I had to sign forms, verbally consent as well. He went off and said the anesthesiast will come in and see me. So the anesthesiast came in, and he just explained to me that you'll be under general anaesthetics, you'll be put to sleep for the operation, all of this. He was asking me if I'm allergic to anything, all of that good stuff, and then he went away. However, 30 minutes went by and he came back and he explained to me that he also wanted to give me an injection in my back because this one would kind of like dead my legs and the lower half of my body and thought it would be beneficial for me to have that numbness in my body but that also carried risks. And the risks involved was that you would get severe pain in your leg for up to a few months after. Now, what you've got to understand is when you're going in for major surgery, you're already nervous, you're already this, you really don't have time to be like, oh, do you know what? Let me go and consult with this person. Let me do my Googles and stuff. Let me, let me just double check. No, because you have to consent there and then. There, there's no time, they need to get you in. And I was just like, okay, fine. You know, again, praying that, please, I don't want any pain. I'm already in pain enough as it is. So I consented to this second injection that would just dead off everything. I only had to wait a couple of hours and it didn't feel like that. It literally felt like it was a few minutes because I was in talks with my family and my friends just, you know, all giving me good luck and well wishes and everything when the anesthesiast came back and said, right, we're ready for your door. And I was like, oh my God. And it's that walk to the surgery room. You, even speaking about it now, I actually feel a bit sick. It's that walk to the surgery room that is just like terrifying. And he's trying to make laugh and joke. And my personality is one way, you know, I'm trying to make a laugh and a joke because I was like, I can't think about this right now. I, I, you know, there's no one to hug to say, you know, see you later, all the rest of it. So he walked in, I had my gown on, so nothing underneath, no knickers, no bra, no nothing. I've got my my gown on backside hanging out, sit upright. Um, so the first thing they did was to wipe a kind of like solution on my back. And then, yeah, you had to be very, very still. So if you think about how an epidural is done, it's the same thing. So it went in, had to stay so still and it stung. And then it felt like water gushing up my back and down my bum. And then all of a sudden, yeah, it just starts to get numb. They kind of twist you onto the table. 
you lie down and then yeah your feet just start going very weird and then obviously they injected me and put the gas mask over me and I don't know what it is if you've ever gone under you try and fight that feeling of you're going to sleep and I was like I'm trying to talk I'm like I'm not going to go to sleep and then in your mind it's like but you have to go to sleep because you don't want to feel that pain <laughs> it's just insane so yeah I fell asleep woke up to my name dawn 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 and he's like it was a success and I was just like thank you god i'm alive first of all it's a success amazing so they keep you in the recovery room i think it's only for about half an hour and then they wheeled me back up to my room so i had a private room so again because of the private medical insurance i had a private room on a ward that only had 20 beds so you are really being seen to and i was put up there to recover so with the recovery i was in there for two nights they check on you constantly, they're doing blood pressure, they're coming in to see how much pain you're in, you're getting painkillers, I had tramadol, I had ibuprofen, I had paracetamol, I had some next thing. They give you antibiotics as well because you've just had a major surgery. So all of these things, they're coming in and they're coming in like clockwork because the pain is indescribable. It is tough. So they're coming in and they're asking you, like I said, your pain, like is from one being you're fine to 10 being whatever, you know, you're, you're literally crawling up the walls. What's your pain like? And like I said, they're giving you the drugs to just make you feel okay. The doctors, nurses, assistants were fantastic because some of the things they had to do, listen, I remember one of the nurses coming in and she goes, Dawn, have you got a pad on like what's going on down there and I was like pad so they meant a sanitary pad I said I don't think so because I was in and out of just wooziness I looked down and I was like oh yeah I do and I moved a bit and I thought and she's like oh let me check you and she's like she's like oh darling she's like let's go to the toilet and just change you oh my god when I got up from that bed so that was the first time of me getting up I was bleeding so, so what I've read is that with an open myomectomy, you can bleed up to three months. They usually say that it should stop around the six week mark and six weeks with this kind of abdominal operation is, that's like when life can really start getting back to normal. So roughly around six weeks, I, when I was doing my whole research and watching YouTube videos, a lot of the ladies were saying, oh, after two weeks I was done. Right, let me just say, let me come back a bit. So the nurse came in, she was like, oh darling, let's go. I got up from that bed. The pad was soaked in a way that I've never seen in my life, right? When I got up from that bed, the bed from my bum, from my vagina, my bum, all the way up my back was filled with blood. You know, when you look at something and you think, oh my goodness, it was disgusting, right? So she took, I remember she took her hand and she, obviously she's got gloves on took out the pad like that, took me in, we had to have a shower and all of that good stuff. Let me come back. When you have this surgery, remember you've been sliced across. One of the things they want you to do quite quickly is to be on your feet because they want you walking. Walking helps with bowel movement and walking works with getting the air out of your body. Because they've opened up there, there's gonna be a lot of air inside your body. So they want you to be able to sort of like pass gas, have a bowel movement, wee as well. So weeing is very important. You cannot leave the hospital until you've done a wee. So they're way up on your feet already. Now, what you've got to imagine, like I said, this is pain I've never, ever, ever experienced in my life. And you're trying to get me out of that bed. You can't use your abdominal muscles. When you've had such an operation, you realize how much you use your abdominal muscles for everything. You, I, Think of like a beached whale trying to get back into the water. The way I had to try and roll out of bed to sit up to walk, and when you walk, because here is split, you're so conscious of the fact that this needs to heal. You don't want to stand upright. It's already in pain, so you're walking like this and you're shuffling, you cannot walk for toffee right and my goodness if you've got a cough or you need to laugh or you need to sneeze you've got to get a pillow and you've got to hold it because when that action happens when you cough sneeze laugh 
Oh my God. It literally feels like your whole stomach is gonna fall out your asshole. It is awful. You feel as though everything is separated inside and it's just gonna drop out that end. It's the most disgusting feeling that I've ever felt. It just feels like there's just nothing there. You're just gonna go <coughs> and literally horrible, horrible feeling. So the walking was so painful, but you had to do it. So I had to wee, and I remember the first time I weed, I was so, so proud of myself. And I was like, oh, no, it's like I've weed. So she looked at it. Yeah, you need to do another one. We need to get the levels up. So again, there needs to be a certain level of urine for you to go home. So like I said to you, I was in hospital for two nights. So after the first night went, my consultant came in to see how I was doing as they would to check. One of the things he said to me before going in, and one of the things I said to him, I said, and you know, you know when you think back to things, you think, I said to him, oh, um, let me know how many you take out because he said at least six. He goes, I can do better than that. I'm gonna take a picture. So I thought, oh no, he's joking. So yeah, he came in after that first night. How are you doing, Dawn? And I was like, oh, I'm in a lot of pain, but no, I'm doing fine. I've been looked after. He's like, he's like I've, got, I've got a little surprise for you. I was like, oh, okay. I was like, well, you know, how many did you take out? 16. Six. It was like a solar system. He'd aligned them up from the biggest to the smallest. I was like, oh my God, 16. And can I emphasize the fact that I was told I had two. I have never been so shocked and disgusted in my life. And the thing that still gets me to this day, if they'd taken it seriously at two, I could have had a myomectomy that is less severe. So either they go through your stomach with the telescopic instruments or the other one that goes up your vagina and it's a day case. But it was allowed to get to such a magnitude that I had to have an open myomectomy. Like I said, the pain for myself, everyone's different, but for myself was indescribable. Right. So he came in, shocked me. I sent it to my friends and my family because I was like, but you guys need to understand the pain I'd been experiencing and why. And the response is honestly, people were so shocked and they were like, oh my God, Dawn, like we can understand now to an extent. Anyways, I'm in hospital. I'm starting to feel a bit better, but I'm still very much out of it. I'm not feeling 100%, but what do you expect when you're in hospital? You, you feel a bit rough, you're looking at yourself, you're just looking sick. I was like, oh my God, I just wanna get home, I wanna get home to my bed, I wanna see my family, my loved ones, all of this stuff. So it came to like, you know, I'd done my two nights and you know, the third day kind of thing. And uh, they said to me, oh Dawn, have you walked about? And at that time I really hadn't because I was in so much pain. They said, look, took my blood pressure. My blood pressure was a little bit low. So they said, you, yeah, you have to just walk about. So I was like, fine, you know, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna be out of here. So I was walking around and I started to feel a lot better because everything, I guess, is moving. So it got to like late afternoon, they took my blood pressure again and they said, actually, you're fine. So if you wanna go home, you can go home. So um, arranged for myself to go home. So what they do over your wound is they give you a plaster that looks like this. I had a white one at first that went over me, but I was allergic. So the bits here started to bubble my skin at the side. So they had to change it to this. And what they say is that over your wound, over the next few days, you've just got to ensure that it doesn't really bleed out. You're gonna see some blood because obviously you may be moving a little bit and whatnot, but it shouldn't really be fully staying in the pad. So it's very important for me to just check that everything was okay, which was absolutely fine. So I went home, like I said, I could barely walk. And what I will say, and I can talk about this in a different video about recovery, is that you really do need help. Like my support system, honestly, to this day, and of course to this day and forever, I am so indebted to them because they were beyond fantastic. Like the love that was shown to me was just amazing. And the care that they gave to me was amazing. I honestly, brilliant fantastic so you know I going up the steps things like going up the stairs you can barely do you can't lift anything heavier than like a like half a full kettle you can't really bend you can't do this you can literally just be in bed so that's where I was I was in bed 
popping tablets because of the pain and all of that good stuff. So anyways, roll forward, I'm checking my pad because you do get a bit conscious, you go into the toilet, you're bleeding, so you're bleeding all the time, right? You're bleeding, so I'm constantly changing pads and you've got to understand how, oh, the roughness of it all is just awful. You can't use tampons because if you use tampons, you could potentially gain an infection from going up there because remember, he's been up in there and he's doing all stuff to your uterus and all the rest of it and you're bleeding. No, you can't use it, so you must use pads with this operation. So I'm constantly going to the toilet and changing, you're like, oh my God, oh. And then I'm checking to see if everything's okay. And it was bleeding out. So one day, I said to my partner, I said, I said, babe, do you think this looks all right? And he's like, look, let's just go to the hospital just for them to double check. And if it's fine, it's fine. We've been, if it's not, then they can change the dressing, right? Perfect, fantastic. So we drive, thank God, it's not too far from where I live. So we got there. So... The lady that came down to get me, the doctor, she had actually looked after me. She was one of the staff that looked after me when I was in the hospital. So she looked at me and she goes, are you okay, Dawn? Are you feeling all right? And I was like, well, yeah. When you say feeling all right, I'm not all right, but I guess, you know, I am how I would expect myself to be in this situation. I was just like, well, I've just been sleeping, like, you know, I'm all right. And she's looking at me and she's like, you don't look well. I was like, I'm fine. She looked at me, my hands, were like a Simpson character, they were yellow, my face was yellow, but what you have to understand, when I looked at myself in the mirror, when you're ill and sick and recovering, you look awful, so I'm looking at myself, and I was just like, I just look ill, I look ill, I look like a granny, I look ill, so I didn't really take any notice of anything, she took one look at me and she said, you're not leaving, I was like, pardon, she's like, you're not going home, you don't look well at all, <sighs> let me tell you, She's like, you have to have a blood transfusion. Pardon? They took my bloods and my bloods were low. They were so low. And I cried and I cried. I was like, my partner's out there. I want to go and see him. No, you can't because of COVID. It's like, but he's outside. Like, he's literally outside. He's waiting for me. I'm calling, not me, my partner's calling. My parents, my mum is collapsing. All of this stuff because I guess when you think of blood transfusion and things like that, it's... It's worst case scenario, right? Like I said, it's one of the major risks. And I'm just like, oh my God, I'm going to pass away. Or, honestly, awful. We have to get you back in. I was on uh, that day. I will never forget you're not leaving. I was like, Pardon, but I felt weak. I felt, you know, when something just clicks in your mind, then I felt weak. So, yeah, I was rolled back into another room. So they had, you know, obviously spare rooms there. So in the little bedroom thing that you get and yeah they said you're having your blood transfusion in a few hours so they had to go and just get a bag of blood that was matched to mine and the catheter is not your standardized catheter it is a big fat uncomfortable painful catheter that's put in your hand and you have to be on the blood transfusion for three hours or then some depending on how long it's going to take to diffuse you cannot move your arm from this position because if you go like this or you're moving around then it's not the blood's not going to transfuse properly from the bag through the tubes into your arm so with that with the blood transfusion every so often every few minutes they're coming in to check that it's doing what you're supposed to be doing they're taking your blood pressure all the rest of it to ensure that you're okay and it honestly it was <sighs> when you just think about i just think back to myself and i think oh my god what if we didn't go in that day what if we were just like you're fine i it's just not worth you know thinking about it really really isn't but again, I was so grateful that that process was able to happen on that day, like straight away, honest to God. So yeah, I had a blood transfusion. I was able to go home the next day, thank God, because yeah, they took my bloods and they skyrocketed all the way back up to how they're supposed to be. So my whole thing was, or their whole thing to me was, go home and you rest. That's all you're doing. So that's what I went back and I did my wound unfortunately on the left side where it, like I said to you in the first video I experienced a lot of the pain he really had to like get in there so 
the way he had to stitch it was very different to my right side and unfortunately that side the left side was taking very long to heal it was oozing all the time so for the next few weeks on a Friday I had to go back into the hospital to get the dressing changed and in the end they ended up giving me a dressing that had a special pump I didn't even know that such technology existed but it had an electric electrical pump that would uh, uh, it would just suck out the fluid and fill up the pad and then you have to go in the week after to get it rechanged if they thought that you needed more time with such so that was absolutely fantastic it has brought the i guess the wound together but on my left side it's a bit it looks like a bit of a, a cave that's how i describe it now for vanity purposes i'm just like do you know what whatever it does look a bit weird but listen I'm alive right am I not so they said to me look when you have your child it's most likely going to be through c-section so once you're sliced and diced again they can stitch it and they can kind of you know do a little something something but at the same time a consultant has said give it time you're still raw it's still you know even here if I go like that now it's still sore so just give it time to heal and whatnot so got home I was able to recover on the tablets and I just tried to really come off it because things like tramadol and I went on to oxycodone things like that it really does space you out I was feeling very ill I threw up with the tablets because it it's just horrible it's, it's so strong your body's not used to such and you're having that with ibuprofen and paracetamol so there was a point in time when I really just tried to firm the pain because I was like I actually don't want to take this anymore slowly but surely I started to feel more strength in myself slowly but surely my wound was able to just heal and breathe on its own so I was able to take off the bandages and I remember feeling just really amazing vaginally I bled for the six weeks I did bleed and it has continued off and on so I've had my second cycle my period and I was spotting up to the period and spotting after, which he said, when I asked my consultant last week, I said, it, you know, should I be concerned? He goes, Dawn, you do realize how many we took out, right? How big they were, right? So it's normal. You just have to give your body time. I think sometimes you go through these things, and you think, oh, I need to be better now, but it's like, no, but you've just had major surgery, just give it time to heal. So I'm trying to be as patient as possible with the healing process the big news is that your girl's journey isn't quite over with that initial consultation i told you about the reason why i was so shocked was the fact that not only did the consultant tell me that i was going to have an open myomectomy he said that i was also going to have a second operation as well i'm going to be having a hysteroscopic operation which is like a knife that goes up in your vagina and it cuts out the rest of the fibroids so the issue with myself is that I had fibroids in and around my stomach and my uterus but also embedded in the uterus as well so this second operation I'm going in is going to take the ones that are inside the wall and that's it so I I'm going through two procedures which is just mad so they had tried to get me to <clears throat> have this second operation quite soon after the open myomectomy but my thing was my body couldn't take it and I think again if you're going through this and you are double bubbling operations because they have advised you to give your body a bit of a break between because there's absolutely no way from a mental perspective and from a physical perspective that I could have just been like oh okay then it's deep it really really is deep so vaginal bleeding with that apparently about two weeks and uh, yeah some people have said a bit less but again everybody's body is different so you know we shall see the positives of the open myomectomy that I've seen so far so I've had two period cycles the first period was painful and a lot of ladies have said that that's how it is but I guess your body's trying to adjust but what I can say is that I've not had any clots I've had no clots it hasn't been heavy like it was before it really really hasn't it's been so so light I've had in both cycles one or two days that are heavy the rest is just non-existent but the heavy that I'm having is not heavy like I used to experience at all and actually my consultant said come the third that your body will be showing you but you know the real period that you're going to have so these two are kind of like off the back of the operation so it'd be really interesting to see what my body does 
Since then, I've had zero back pain, zero bum pain. I've had no pain in my leg. Like the quality of life has just changed. And I just feel like, but that is so mad how that thing or things was impacting my health like what the actual heck so yeah i've had none of that pain whatsoever i haven't experienced any kind of bad period like symptoms on the lead up or anything like that like my life has been transformed already as i said one of the biggest reasons for sharing this is because i genuinely believe that if an experience can help others i would want to share that fibroids affects women of all races but for the most part it affects black women there isn't enough research around this i would love to just find out like why is it that women like myself black women are affected like what is it what is it i'm very passionate about this now and yeah I really, really am because I am now hearing many other women are going through this and they don't know what to do. What I will say off the back to all of you is that if there is something up with your body, if you're experiencing things, like I said, do not ignore it. And unfortunately it is a case of just fighting for yourself to be seen. Not everyone is privileged to have access to private healthcare you're really not but like i said you can try and elect that from your doctor but also to pursue the reasons don't get fobbed off ask for second opinion i truly believe had i been listened to had i had maybe a, a doctor that really put my best interests at heart that i wouldn't have had to have the open myomectomy there are other treatments available for instance you can shrink your fibroids you know like I said, there's other operations that are less severe. There's a whole heap of things that can happen. But when it got to the size that it did for myself and how many, it, it gone too far. I'm also thinking about my biological clock. I don't have time really to be waiting and trying this and trying that. But everyone is different. I'm not a doctor, so I'm certainly not here to say, everyone go and get an open myomectomy. Not at all. Do your own research and do what is best for you. That is so important for me to say. Some people are dead against operations. There's a lots of women who are on the whole wave of shrinking. And like I said, if you've got the time or, or whatever it is, please do go and do what you need to do. But for me, I can truly say for those who are on the open myomectomy journey, for me personally, it has been a success with regards to the immediateness of it all. From what I can see, I can only talk at this point in time the the pain's gone the pain has gone and that's truly amazing to myself to be able to go a full month and i'm not oh 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 you know it's amazing so for that i'm thankful i'm praying for this second operation that it is smooth sailing it's just a day case which is good i am going under yet again so i'm really praying for that because not being funny yeah i'm just praying and uh, I just hope that, yeah, you know, I'll be able to come back and talk about that procedure and what that was like and the after effects for those of you who are interested in that. So, yes, guys, that's my fibroid story. That's what I've been dealing with of late. This is me in the first stages of recovery. And I hope that this video was of help to, even if it's just one of you, but to some of you and yeah i'll be sharing more of my journey as always you can subscribe to my youtube channel so you can keep up to date with further videos on this and other things as well and follow me on instagram where i am very interactive with those of you who are connected with me there but for now take care and i'll speak to you soon